On April 25, 2016, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee Xi Jinping made a visit to Xiaogang during an inspection tour of Anhui province. It was the first time Xi had set foot in this modest yet historically important village, although as a young man 38 years earlier, he had certainly spent time in Anhui. This is Anhui专门到小港村来看一看这也是我的一个心愿我是在一九七八年我来过这里就是没有到小港村我到了初中当时来我记得一本那个笔记我还是收藏着呢印象很深刻因为这是我改革开放以后啊接触农村的可以说是这个改革
The main problem in rural work is still that people's thinking is not sufficiently emancipated. With Dung's backing, prohibitions were lifted to allow peasants to make decisions and experiment by themselves. By the end of 1984, more than 99% of production teams nationwide had implemented the Household Contract Responsibility System, which was essentially the same as the all-round contract system initiated in Xiaogang village. Deng Xiaoping hailed China's rural reform as a great creation of the nation's peasants. In October 1983, the CPC Central Committee and the State Council issued notice on the separation of government administration from commune management and the establishment of township governments, which officially put an end to the old system in which the People's Commune was both an administrative and economic unit. Following the success of rural reform, township and village enterprises emerged as a new force. Peasants adjusted their efforts to local conditions and formed their own patterns of development through trials and practices with a strong local flavor. Lu Guanzhou, the founder of Wanxiang Group in Zhejiang province, signed a contract with the township government in which he took on all risks for a factory's operations. Under his command, the enterprise then grew into the first Chinese auto parts company to enter the American market. The rapid development of township and village enterprises brought dramatic changes to China's countryside. By 1987, the number of such enterprises nationwide had grown to more than 17.5 million. Their combined annual output value was 476.4 billion yuan, making up 50.4% of the rural economy. For the first time, the sector exceeded total agricultural output. Towns and small cities flourished with the growth of these enterprises. The structural divide between China's urban and rural areas began to change, creating conditions critical for the construction of a new countryside with Chinese characteristics. The first breakthrough of China's reform was made in the countryside. The CPC was then able to learn from the practices and innovations of peasants. It continued to push ahead, bringing profound changes to the nation's vast rural areas and unleashing their potential. Lessons from the rural reform were incorporated into China's later reform of its urban economic system, which was far more complicated. After the third plenary session of the 11th CPC Central Committee, reform of China's urban economic system was gradually pushed through nationwide, with expanded decision-making powers for enterprises as a key element. In April 1979, the CPC Central Committee and State Council decided to launch pilot reform programs in eight large state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, in cities including Beijing, Tianjin, and Shanghai. Giving the SOEs the power to make their own decisions shook the traditional planned economy. Before the reform, they had been obliged to follow central state production planning. Afterwards, they began to study their markets, promote their products, and care about profit and loss. On June 25, 1979, Ningjiang Machine Tools Factory in Sichuan Province published an advertisement in the newspaper People's Daily, becoming the first to advertise its products since reform and opening up had begun. The factory then received an avalanche of calls, letters and even personal visits from all over the country to place orders. Contracts for more than 1,000 sets of machine tools were signed at home and abroad. Both the factory and its workers gained substantially from improved sales.
By June 1980, the experiment had expanded to include 6,600 SOEs. On September the 2nd, the State Council approved the State Economic Commission's report on the pilot program of expanding decision-making powers for enterprises and recommendations for the future, which granted all-round decision-making powers to enterprises from 1981 onwards. In 1979, a multitude of educated youths returned from the countryside to their homes in the city. To alleviate the resulting employment pressure, the central government resolved to support the development of private enterprises, as well as China's urban collective economy. With public ownership continuing to play a dominant role, diverse forms of ownership began to develop side by side. In June of the same year, Yin Shengxi, a Beijing native, quit his secure job at a sub-district government office. He then partnered with 20 educated youths who had returned from the countryside to open a tea house called Big Bowl Tea. With nostalgic branding, his cheap beverages found popularity with locals who remembered community life in the old city. In Wuhu, Anhui, meanwhile, a sole proprietor called Nian Guangzhou was building his company selling roasted sunflower seeds. He hired hundreds of staff, far exceeding what was then the legally allowed limit of seven. Against conservative voices within the party, Deng Xiaoping said putting Nian's shops out of business would cause anxiety and amount to no good. So what if we let him go on selling his seeds for a while, he asked. Will that hurt socialism? Deng Xiaoping said that it was not for one person, but for the whole people to destroy the whole world. In 1981, after the Chinese government issued policies and regulations on the urban non-agricultural private economy, self-employment officially became legal. Alongside the process of reform, major breakthroughs were also made in opening China to the outside world. In July 1978, Xi Zhongshun chose Chongying Street in Guangdong's Bao'an County as the first stop of his investigative tour after he took office in the provincial government. The Hong Kong side of the street was flourishing, while the mainland side, just a few meters away, was depressed. The dramatic contrast inspired Xi Zhongshun to think about how to develop the Guangdong region bordering Hong Kong. In October, the Guangdong government submitted a report entitled On Foreign Trade Bases and Municipal Planning of Bao'an and Zhuhai Counties to the State Council. It proposed designating the two counties as municipalities directly under the provincial government. In January 1979, Guangdong Province and the Ministry of Transport jointly submitted a report to the State Council proposing the establishment of an industrial zone in the Shirko area of Bao'an. It was approved by the central government. After much work on infrastructure construction, Shirko Industrial Zone, the first ever in China to open to the outside world, was inaugurated. In March, the State Council approved the renaming of Bao'an County in Guangdong Province as Shenzhen City. On April the 8th, Xi Zhongshun, then First Secretary of the CPC Guangdong Provincial Committee, stated in a speech at the Central Work Conference 
that with its location neighboring Hong Kong and Macau, and with the large number of overseas Chinese from those territories, Guangdong should actively carry out international economic and technological exchanges. He asked the central government to allow the province to make its own moves towards opening up by establishing export processing zones in the coastal cities of Shenzhen, Zhuhai and Shantou. The leadership of Fujian province also proposed to copy this model. Deng Xiaoping suggested calling them Special Economic Zones, or SEZs. He said, the central government doesn't have the funds for you, but it can provide policy support so that Guangdong is able to fight its own way to success. On August 26, 1980, the 15th meeting of the Standing Committee of the 5th National People's Congress approved the establishment of special economic zones in Shenzhen, Zhuhai and Shantou in Guangdong and Xiamen in Fujian. Years have passed since the initial struggle to build Shukou as an industrial zone. The Shenzhen Special Economic Zone has become a world-class metropolis, demonstrating the outstanding achievements of China's reform and opening up. Shenzhen economic development successfully demonstrated that the the 是完全正确的。经济特区不仅要继续办下去，而且要办得更好，办得水平更高。1979 saw the start of economic reform in China. The new possibilities it created pushed people to think in hitherto impossible ways. On November the 26th, 1979, Deng Xiaoping put forward a brand new idea during an interview with an American journalist. We can develop market economy under socialism. On December the 6th, during a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Ohira Masayoshi, Deng Xiaoping emphasized that the four modernizations China was striving for were to be achieved with Chinese characteristics and that China's goal was to become a moderately prosperous society by the end of the 20th century. Developing a market economy under socialism and building a moderately prosperous society were early manifestations of China's economic reform and modernization. With the goals outlined, the question now was which path China should take in order to achieve its objectives. On September the 1st, 1982, Deng Xiaoping made an important statement in his opening speech at the 12th CPC National Congress. Socialism with Chinese characteristics has been the answer to the key question of what path China should follow since its reform and opening up started. It has become the great banner guiding reform, opening up and socialist modernization in the new era. But what exactly is socialism with Chinese characteristics? A clear definition was needed. On October 20th, 1984, the third plenary session of the 12th CPC Central Committee adopted the CPC Central Committee's decision on the reform of the economic system, dismantling the false dichotomy of planned economy versus market economy, and defining for the first time the nature of China's socialist economy as a market economy based on central planning and public ownership. Deng Xiaoping hailed the document as the first draft of political economy that combined the basic principles of Marxism with China's socialist practice. 
He thought highly of the document, given its clarification of the socialist path China was about to take. It worked to imbue the entire nation with a spirit of optimism and vitality. The same year, Deng Xiaoping traveled south to Shenzhen, Zhuhai and Xiamen for the first time, fully affirming the results of building the SEZs. Subsequently, the central government decided to open up another 14 coastal port cities. State-owned enterprises were given more decision-making powers in operations and production. China's first generation of migrant workers left their rural homes to work in cities. Also, in 1984, China launched its first experimental communications satellite. For the first time, a Chinese scientific expedition team traveled to Antarctica. China won its first ever gold medal in the Olympic Games. The Chinese women's volleyball team won three consecutive world championships, firing up the entire nation with confidence. On October 1st, 1984, a grand military parade was staged in Tiananmen Square to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. It was the 12th National Day military parade since the founding of New China and also the first of its kind in 25 years. Joining the procession, students from Peking University held high a banner that read, Hello Xiaoping, expressing their respect and love for the great leader who had mapped the course of China's reform and opening up. Scientists and technology experts were also inspired and encouraged. In March 1986, Four renowned Chinese scientists called on the CPC Central Committee for China to study advanced technology worldwide and develop high technology at home. They received an unequivocal reply from Deng Xiaoping. This program shall be initiated without delay. So 已经初步决定准备花一百个亿。China's National Initiative for Developing High Technology was called the 863 program, and it was approved by the central government in November 1986 with tens of thousands of scientists in different fields now working together to tackle technological challenges, China's high-tech development entered a new era. The 13th CPC National Congress was held in Beijing from October the 25th to November the 1st, 1987. For the first time in history, the Congress systematically expanded the party's theory of the primary stage of socialism and proposed economic development as the central task, with its four cardinal principles and policy of reform and opening up as two basic points for policy making during this stage. 
In accordance with Deng Xiaoping's vision, the Congress also defined a development strategy with a three-stage path up to the mid-21st century to achieve China's modernization, drawing up a new blueprint for building socialism with Chinese characteristics. In its explorations into integrating the basic tenets of Marxism with the concrete realities of China, the CPC has blazed a path of socialism with Chinese characteristics. The initiation and development of this path was a great achievement of the CPC's central leadership with Deng Xiaoping at its core and a great result of its constant efforts to unite the Chinese nation, emancipate people's minds and seek truth from facts in constant exploration and innovation. Sure. 